watching a global celebration of all things Notre Dame, where we invite you to watch, connect, give, and vote. This is Notre Dame Day, live from the LaFortune Student Center. If you're just joining us for the first time, welcome to hour number 29, the final hour of Notre Dame Day, a 29-hour global celebration of the University of Notre Dame. I'm Jeff Jeffers, a 1977 graduate of Notre Dame. I'm here at the LaFortune Student Center on campus, just a few yards away from the university's main building and the famous Golden Dome. This has been our broadcast headquarters for the past 28 hours as we have celebrated all things Notre Dame. We've been joined by Notre Dame students, alumni, parents, friends, and fans from all over the world. I'm joined by fellow Notre Dame alum, class of 67, Mike Collins, the public address announcer at Notre Dame Stadium. All right, Jeff, thank you very much. Should point out, some members of this crew have been here for all 29 hours. Uh, well, two of them are on the floor, but uh, they've been here for 29 hours, so let's hear it for that. Okay. <laughs> Great job. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a very special and historic day here at Notre Dame. We would like to thank all of our friends in the broadcast industry who have returned home, some traveling across the country to take part in an event that no other university has ever tried to undertake. And by the way, SC, just try. I know I speak for Notre Dame when I say that we cannot thank all of you enough for sharing your talents with us. We would also like to thank the hundreds of students, faculty, and staff who have made this live broadcast possible. This has truly been a historic moment, Jeff, in the 172-year history of this university that we all love so much. But we are not done yet. This hour, we will talk live with Knut Rockney III. And of course, Jeff knows as well as anybody, that's the historically correct way to pronounce Newt. You taught it, me that. Yeah. Is Canute. You got Americanized somewhere along the way. And this is very exciting. We will have a live interview with Notre Dame All American quarterback Brady Quinn. Who gets to do that interview? All right. So now let's go out to our Notre Dame Day reporter, Amanda Starantino, who is at one of the most iconic places on this beautiful campus. Amanda? All right. Oh, well, thank you, Mike. And I'm here at the Law Chapel with Father Paul Doyle. And this is where everything started. Can you give us a brief tour? There's so much history. Gladly, Amanda. Let's start with the people who served the Native Americans before Holy Cross got here. Notre Dame was founded 1842. Father Baden is buried under the Log Chapel. There's a stone here denoting that. First priest ordained in this country. And there are three other priests buried under the log chapel. They were circuit riders who served the Native Americans on this land. Uh, we have other things here like artifacts in the sacristy. Uh, I took a lady back there recently and showed her a monstrance and she said, oh my, I haven't seen a monstrance like that since I was a child. Then she read the little plaque that said, uh, 1756 or something like that. So she got a laugh out of that, that she wasn't a child at that point. But uh, there are a lot of old things like keys. We have swipe cards and all these combinations to get in things now, but there's some enormous keys back there in chalices, investments that Father Soren wore. So uh, those things are there. This building was in disrepair when Holy Cross got here. The roof was sagging. The Native Americans hadn't been here in four years, and uh, this building was repaired. So the little group that founded Notre Dame had a place to live that first winter and then moved into a building next door called now called Old College, which was the first building built here. So Native Americans were Catholic Christians on this real estate for a long time, from the 1600s, until 1842, but we were the first permanent uh, clergy here and started the university, of course. But not just the university, 
there was a grade school here. The students were called Menems, and there was an apprentice school here, a manual labor school, as well as a university from the get-go. So this place now is used for weddings and baptisms. There's a student mass here on Tuesday nights at 10 o'clock, which fills the place up. Right, there are about three dozen chairs in here, so they're not large weddings, but there are many anniversaries of weddings here. How many about weddings and baptisms have you done? Here? Oh my, I wouldn't. Uh, weddings, only a handful. Baptisms, several a month. And I've been a priest 37 years, mostly here at Notre Dame, so lots of them. And anniversary masses uh, of people married elsewhere, but they get their closest together here and recall their 50th or something like this. So this place is used intensively and is very popular. Okay. And this you, this oh. is a replica, actually, of the log chapel that was here for Father Soren. That one burned down 100 years ago. And uh, I think someone said that it had devolved into a place to where pigs lived because there were so many other nice chapels on campus. And then after this fire bur that burned it down, it was decided shortly that we really need to stay in touch with our origins, and the log chapel was rebuilt. And um, you had mentioned Father Soren. Tell us one of your favorite stories about him. I think the guy was amazing myself. Uh, one thing I like about him, you've seen those bicycles that have one great big front wheel and a little back wheel. They're called velocipedes or something like that. They were big in the 19th century. He brought one of those back from France. And there are pictures that are extant of folks riding around on that thing, especially the children delighted in this fad. I like that story. He used to like to... Uh, play marbles with the children that were the minims, ages 6 to 13 in that grade school. And he was pretty good at it. That's a story I like about Soren. He was good at playing marbles. He, uh, when the gold dome burned down, the priest council around him would not agree to making uh, the new main building with a gold dome on it. They wanted to make a dome and paint it yellow. So he moved over to St. Mary's for a week, and without him, the president of the council, they couldn't meet, they couldn't appropriate money, they couldn't spend money. So they capitulated, and he came back, and they built the gold dome instead of a dome painted yellow. So he was a forceful character and a man of great faith. He didn't believe in lightning rods for the, up until the main building burned down. He thought, let's entrust things to the care of Our Lady. That's indicative of his faith. People told him to buy insurance. He was very reluctant to buy fire insurance and never bought enough. So this guy was, he was quite a sport. He made 50 trips, more than 50 trips across the Atlantic to gather resources to sustain this place. He tried to address the needs of the world he was living in. He, there was an apprentice, the manual labor school here, so, and the university. Well, thank you, Father, for sharing all this with us and spending time with us tonight, sharing this all with the rest of us to end Notre Dame Day. And so we're going to send it back to Mike in the studio. Thank you, thank you Amanda. And please tell uh, Father Doyle, I think he's one of the finest people I've ever met on this campus. What a, what a gentleman. Well, I'm in the studio now with Michael McCuro, an intern at Campus Ministry. And uh, I hear you returned from a week-long pilgrimage uh, to Rome yes for Holy Week yes uh, had to be inspiring but tell me about it what did you get out of it Michael well it's cool I mean so I'm, I'm working campus ministry now and I remember at the very bottom of my contract it said go to the pilgrimage on Rome and help organize it. and I was like oh my god what a deal breaker I have to not take this job now you know <laughs> but yeah no it's cool because every every year uh, for the past couple of years at least um, campus ministries has been organizing a pilgrimage uh, to Rome during for Easter for Holy Week uh, for all the students in Europe who are studying abroad. Um, and what we do is just basically gather some students together to visit some of the important churches uh, in Rome, visit, for example, some of the passion relics, see some of the burial places of some of the most important saints, uh, and then just you know all coming together on Easter Sunday uh, where we attend Mass at St. Peter's Basilica, mm -hmm. St. Peter's Square. Um, and so it was just really cool because I attended it uh, as a student a couple years ago, 
uh, to kind of come around and be organizing that was really cool for me. I don't know, like probably the highlight of my time, like like a couple weeks ago, there was uh, being five feet away from Pope Francis. We started the mass was at 10:15 a.m. on Easter Sunday. We started lining up at 6 a.m. Um, and that gave us enough time to be able to, you know, be five feet away from Pope Francis, and that was really cool <laughs> to do that. Did you tell him that was really cool? I, I try to give See, him a Notre Dame. He would have grasped that, you know, if you said it was really cool. Yes. <laughs> I, I think it's very cool myself. Uh, tell us uh, a little bit about some of the other pilgrimages that uh, Campus Ministry offers. Yeah, sure. I mean, the pilgrimage program in uh, Campus Ministry, I really think, has, is taking off a lot. Um, I mean, there's so many pilgrimages offered all across the world now. Um, I know that, you know, for example, next fall um, alone, there's going to be pilgrimages to Mexico City and France. Mm -hmm. um, and to, the, the pilgrimage to France is going to be focusing a little bit about the life of Saint of uh, Blessed Basil Moreau, who's the founder of the Congregation of the Holy Cross. Mm -hmm. um, and the pilgrimage to Mexico City gives students a chance to explore um, Mexican Catholicism. Um, so it's just kind of cool to see how, you know, you, different both hemispheres of the world, you know, you're mm -hmm. kind of seeing... Uh, d pilgrimages to now the Center for Social Concerns sure. has a new one uh, next year. Sure. Tell us a little bit more about it, and I hope I'm doing the pronunciation right, right of uh, Saint Andre. I'm going to say Seminage. Yes, I think it, I would call it Seminage as well. Okay. <laughs> I think that's right. Right, right pronunciation. Um, yeah, so that it's a it's a joint project between Campus Ministry and the Center for Social Concerns, basically combining. Uh, the idea of a pilgrimage with the idea of service. Mm -hmm. um, and so St. Andre is yeah, the first saint to be canonized from the Congregation of the Holy Cross. And we're going there uh, to, we're going to, to Phoenix, Arizona, uh, where we have the Andre House. Uh, and there we're going to be uh, mm -hmm. serving the local community. Okay. There's several points, I would think, to, to, to a pilgrimage. But the main point would seem to be trying to deepen one's faith. Yes. Did you walk away with that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, a pilgrimage is obviously like a physical journey, but it's also, I think, like a spiritual journey as well. You know, like you, you go to a place and you really engage with what that place is all about, the spirit of that place. And I think it's something that really kind of transforms you and transforms your faith. So, and one, uh, tell me one more thing, why is it important to go on a pilgrimage? Well, I think, I mean, other than deepening your faith, going on a pilgrimage here at Notre Dame can really teach you a lot about what Notre Dame um, is all about. Mm -hmm. um, like going on the Montreal pilgrimage, for example, when I was a junior, um, taught me a real lot about St. Andre Bisset. And it was the first time really where I learned about the Congregation of the Holy Cross um, and mm -hmm. learned a little bit about, you know, what Notre Dame, the spirit of Notre Dame, the kind of the spirit of making God known, loved, and served. Um, and so it's a really good way to explore, you know, what Notre Dame, the Notre Dame spirit is all about. Finally about you, I heard something in the back. How many languages do you speak and how uh, many do you understand? <laughs> Oh my goodness, uh, I've, I dabble in maybe about four or five. I majored in classics, so I know Latin and Greek pretty well, so all the dead languages. <laughs> but um, I've studied Italian and Japanese as well, um, and you know, enjoy, enjoy them uh, very much. I don't, know, I don't know how articulate I am in them, but I really enjoy them. You are gonna go far, and it, it's young people like you that are, make Notre Dame what it is today, Michael. Uh, thank I, you I mean so much, sincerely. Mike, I appreciate that. Hey, Jeff, back to you, bud. There are few truly iconic names in all of sport, and one of them happens to be the all-time winningest football coach in Notre Dame history, a Norwegian Protestant who came to Notre Dame as a student, played a little football, ran a little track, graduated, became a chemistry professor, and then went on to become arguably the greatest football coach of all time, Knut Rocky. I'm excited to be joined now on the phone by a high school football coach in Utah who just happens to share the same name, Knut Kenneth Rockney III, grandson of the legendary Notre Dame coach. Coach, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Now, Knut is the proper pronunciation of your name and your grandfather's name, right? Yes, it is. It's the Norwegian. What's it like to be a football coach in this country with the name Knut Rockney? <laughs> um, originally, when I first started, when I was much younger, it, there was a lot bigger deal to it. Um, Right now, as I get near the end of my, my coaching career and my uh, teaching time, uh, a lot of kids don't know who he was. Mm -hmm. And so it's as each generation gets a little older and they get a little farther and farther away from the impact my grandfather had, uh, fewer and fewer people make the connection. So tell us about your own coaching career. I, the kids on your high school team, have they connected with your famous lineage? 
I think it, 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 for the most part, yeah. The, the kids that we coach at some point in time, either you know on, on practice or during workouts, and I'll wear some Notre Dame gear, they have an, an idea of you know who, who my grandfather is, so they understand why you know I, I wear Notre Dame stuff. Um, right now, we have a young man playing for us who will be a senior next year, but he's being recruited by Notre Dame, and he went back to uh, Notre Dame this past summer, and uh, when he came back, he, all he did was talk about how great the campus was in his visit, and He's very excited about the opportunity to be recruited by Notre Dame. I, I'd say we had an in there. Your grandfather I, revolutionized the sport when it was up in the air because of the violence and the contact in the game. He redesigned uniform. He re redesigned the pads they wear. His impact on the game was so far reaching. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Well, I, I think before you talk about those kinds of things, I think the biggest difference when you talk about Grandpa and his impact on the game, he was one of the very first people who, who talked about um, the mental aspect of the game and how he was more concerned with getting smart players mm -hmm. who were good students and, and that kind of stuff than just the great big giant, you know, um, physical people who played the smash mouth, you know, kind of football. That wasn't Grandpa's style. He was much more intellectual and uh, his aspect was like the invention of the Notre Dame shift to the box, you know, the single wing. Grandpa kind of revolutionized football with, with that aspect from a mental standpoint of just being able to take smaller players but yet use speed and quickness and mental agility, so to speak, in order to, you know, defeat their opponents. He also had a keen appreciation for public relations, taking his team to New York City, playing Army, getting a lot of attention from the nation's press at that time. There was no internet, was no TV, barely radio. He really had his ear tuned to public relations, didn't he? I, I think he, he had a, one of the first individuals to understand the importance of mass media and for that period of time, the 20s, you know, it was radio, and um, he was very in tune with that. He he knew the the power and influence that sports writers had, and so he was always in a position where he tried to you know help them you know write a story as well as present a, a product that was going to favor Notre Dame. And you know, when you talk about going to New York or going to Los Angeles or those other places. Notre Dame was the first major school to play outside, you know, a localized mm -hmm. region, the, the Midwest. And because of what Notre Dame did, um, it brought about the creation of the NCAA. There had to be a national group to control all of the schools because, you know, pretty soon people were going different places and there wasn't any way to, to control them other than just by conference rules. And so because Notre Dame played without a conference and they would play anybody anywhere, so to speak, the NCAA evolved to be that legislative group. How closely do you follow Notre Dame these days, Canute? Oh, I do every day. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm... I'm in, in tune as much as probably any other fan, yeah. How often do you get back to campus? We were just back. I, I had the pleasure of taking my, my uh, grandson, Knut IV, and he attended his first function. We went back to the spring game. Oh, that's so great. So I was there just a couple weeks ago. That's great. Yeah, it was, a, it was a fun time. Well, Coach Rockney, thank you so much for joining us on Notre Dame Day. Your grandfather's legacy with Notre Dame is unmatched. Hope your team has a great season this fall. Go Irish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now it's time to go to our Notre Dame reporter, Catherine Dudas, who's in the performance area. Thank you. I'm here with the very talented Undertones. 12 members strong, the Undertones are Notre Dame's premier male a cappella group. They tour nationally and internationally. Very impress impressive. And we are very lucky because they are going to perform for us. So without further ado, here are the Undertones. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. That was great. All right, we're going to go back to Jeff, uh, who's on the line with a very special guest. Thanks a lot. I know of no other man who is the epitome of being a Notre Dame man than our next guest. All-American at Notre Dame, Maxwell Award winner, Brady Quinn. Brady, what's up these days? Not much, Jeff. I'm actually uh, I'm out here in L.A. right now doing some work with the NFL Network. Oh, that's great. Um, I know the women are going to be disappointed with this, but you've tied the knot. 
Tell us how that's going. <laughs> uh, I did tie the knot on uh, March 7th of this past year. So it was a, it was an absolutely perfect day. Uh, I feel very blessed to have met someone who's my soulmate, and uh, we're just enjoying the married life right now. We've, we've actually both been traveling a lot lately, so it's been hard to kind of uh, get a good week how we can just be together, uh, but it's been fun. She's got an athletic background too, doesn't she, Brady? <laughs> yeah, most would say she's a better athlete than I. So <laughs> she, uh, she was the uh, silver medalist in the 2008 uh, Olympics, and she's actually the most decorated female Olympic gymnast um, in world uh, championship gymnast there is. That's great. You were a quarterback at Notre Dame in a transition time, Brady. You had some very good wide receivers. Smarja, Carlson, Fasano. Do you ever see those guys in your travels in the NFL? And is it sort of a, a Notre Dame mini reunion? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously not, you know, Samarja. Uh, I try to keep in touch and follow his career as much as you can when he's playing baseball. But I think, you know, John and, and Anthony, I'm, I'm very close with. Uh, we both actually live down in Florida in the offseason, so I'm able to just see him a good amount. But uh, we always try to get together whenever we can. And we reminisce, but we also kind of try to add on to the good times as well. That's great. Brady, when you were here at Notre Dame, you really bought into the concept of being a student athlete, a young man involved with a lot of things. Was that your conscious thoughts going into your college career that you were going to plunge headfirst into being more than just a football player? I think the college experience for most young adults is, is really an opportunity for them to find out who they are as a person. And I know that Notre Dame felt like the best place for me. It was an opportunity for me to uh, experience all I could and develop as a man and develop spiritually and uh, it's obviously continue to develop as a football player as well. I've got my opinion on this next question. I want to hear yours. What was your favorite moment inside Notre Dame Stadium? <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. It, it, it's tough to say. I mean, there are so many good moments. Um, I think saying goodbye to the fans my senior year uh, after the Army game was one of them. I think, uh, you know, being in the tunnel, uh, for the very first time my freshman year when we played against Washington State running out was one of them. Um, you know, the UCLA comeback was a ton of fun. I think the you know the, the USC game, really the last opportunity we had to touch the ball, kind of sticking the ball across the goal line and scoring. So it, it's really too hard to put into maybe one memory. I think the whole entire career, my whole entire I, I would vote for that, so that. I would vote for that UCLA game when you hit Samarja for the touchdown. Uh, I understand you and former Notre Dame All-American Jeff Fain have teamed up with the NFL for a project. Tell us about it. Yeah, so um, uh, it's a couple of years now. We actually came across the idea to help better educate you know, some of the NFL you know, players on how to invest their money wisely. So we came up with the concept to uh, invest with an impact, and we actually made it and built it around the NFL's curriculum. They already had a little bit existing at some of their Ivy League schools, but we felt like Notre Dame was better outfitted to you know support these players and give them mentors so we started a program called investing with an impact two years ago and we've allowed for all types of players um current players veteran players as well to come to Notre Dame for a, a four-day seminar a seminar to understand how to invest properly uh, understand how to start a uh, you know a charitable organization or even a um or, or any other sort of business that they feel like can help provide some sort of social impact uh to the community Brady, are there guys in the NFL who just waste their money just because they get it so quickly and just fritter it away? Well, I think there's a number of issues that take place in the NFL why, you know, guys aren't able to save their money. I think part of it is not having understanding of their actual contract, what is guaranteed to them, what they're actually going to make. I think a lot of guys actually, sad to say, don't understand taxation. They don't understand that, you know, based on where we play and based on the agent fees, et cetera, you make about 50% of whatever you are slated to make. And uh, furthermore, I think, you know, guys unfortunately get pushed into a lifestyle that they kind of see on TV or they see in older veteran players sometimes live and they feel like they need to compete because they're competitive in nature or they want to try to live that type of lifestyle. And unfortunately, the money isn't as much as they think, you know, as far as professional sports goes, the NFL is the NFL is one of the poorer sports mm -hmm. in regards to the compensation for athletes. 
Brady, how satisfying was it when you walked up, t up that tunnel for the last time? You knew you were going to uh, be a Notre Dame graduate. You know, it was, it was honestly, it was a sad moment for me because I felt like a lot of people at Notre Dame uh, were able to kind of actually watch me grow up into a young man over my course of time at Notre Dame. So it was tough for me to, you know, be able to say goodbye because I had so many touching memories and I felt like I grew up a lot on that field in front of those people. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I think, you know, we obviously all wish you played there. We could have done more. We could have, you know, went and won a national championship. That wasn't necessarily what took place, but I think we did leave it better off than, mm -hmm. you know, how we found it. No question about that. Brady, thanks for joining us. Good luck this fall, either in the NFL or when, we, when you come back to see your alma mater play. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Jeff. Okay, now let's join Amanda in the Social Media Command Center for the last time. Amanda? Hey, we are in the Social Com Media Command Center where a lot of the magic has happened tonight. And these people working at all these computers, their eyes must be so sore because they have been nonstop for the past almost 30 hours, they're telling me. And so we have Mark, Jonathan, and Mickey to tell us a little bit more about what's been going on right here. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody out there and uh, the Notre Dame family for being a part of Notre Dame Day. As you can see, we have less than 30 minutes left till the end of Notre Dame Day. Now remember, it is NotreDameDay.nd.edu. Head there right now. Big green button. It's waiting for you. It's been waiting for you for the last 29 hours and so odd minutes, and it's still there. Give and vote through the big green button. Help get your favorite parts of the university their share of the $250,000 in challenge funds. Now I'm going to pass it on for the last time to Jonathan. Thank you for being a part of Notre Dame Day, this first ever Notre Dame Day. And here we go. Jonathan, what's going on in social? Mark, thanks so much. Thanks again to everybody who tuned in. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. We certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. Thanks so much for your support of Notre Dame, not just today, but every single day of the year. We have the best alumni, the best fans in the whole world, and that's thanks to all of you. Social media, it's up for grabs. It's between Knott, Keenan, Morrissey, and Stanford. Uh, they're battling for votes down to the very end of the wire. Morrissey's big on social media right now, telling everybody support the manor. They're breaking it down step by step. Navigate to notredamebay.nd.edu slash donate. Number two, make your votes. Vote all three for Morrissey. Uh, they're after it. It's going to go right down to the wire, uh, which is awesome. Again, thanks to all you guys. Uh, and where are we at with the rest of the leaderboard, Mickey? Wow, Jonathan, this is exciting, isn't it? Neck and neck, these top, top four residence halls here at the top of the leaderboard. But what's most amazing, check this out, Jonathan. Total gift count, 3886. Folks, we are so, so close to this 4,000 gift count for the inaugural Notre Dame Day. Log on, click that big green button, make your gift to the University of Notre Dame and vote for your favorite area and help the Notre Dame family reach this 4,000 votes. Friends, there's nothing greater than the gift of the University of Notre Dame education. Let's make it possible tonight. And we are so close and it's because of all the work that you guys did. So thank you so much for doing all this and keeping it going on social media because that seems what everybody is hooked on lately. And so we're gonna send it back over to Mike at the anchor desk. All right, Amanda, thank you very much to you, to Jonathan, and to Mickey. And now it's time to bring this historic 29-hour-long live broadcast to an end. And what a broadcast it has been. We have visited with members of the Notre Dame family in so many places around this world, from Panama to India and Colombia, from London and Switzerland, from China to Ireland and Brazil. We've had guest clubs from every time zone in America and some very amazing performances from students and alumni. We've learned about pivotal research and innovations happening every day at this university. We've heard inspiring stories and great moments from students, faculty, parents, and friends of Notre Dame that we've visited with. Notre Dame students from every residence hall, every college and school on this campus, and all have helped make this a lasting memory and a wonderful celebration. But what has made this broadcast great, besides the crew, truly great, is you. You who have turned in and tuned in and have participated in celebrating Notre Dame. You have made this a very meaningful Notre Dame day. 
just as you make Notre Dame special every day by your love of this great university. And now it's only fitting in this, the 29th and final hour, to say goodbye in the place where it all began. Back to the Log Chapel for a very special performance, which is our small way of saying thank you for your love of the University of Notre Dame. Thank you. 